Hey, Laurel. Hey, Jessa. Who's our guest today? We have Sarah from the Legacies of War. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hello. Hi. And how are we connected to Sarah? Uh, we met Sarah through Elizabeth from Article 22, who was on our podcast a few months ago, and she was discussing um, public-private partnerships with Article 22 and um, the jewelry that they had made or are making, I should say, in Laos and the work that they do to give back to the community and the people making this and um, part of their business models to support legacies of war. Mm -hmm. And so she was telling us about the work that you guys do, Sarah, and she said, you have to meet her. And then we, we've had the, you know, we've been fortunate to speak mm -hmm. with you a few times and I've just been so excited to have you on and, and hear more about the work you do and your background. And yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me as well. I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, we just, we there's so much to cover and we've enjoyed connecting with you so much. It's like, where do we start? I know, right? We could be here all day. Well, let's talk about Legacies of War as the first step and we'll see where we go. Um, as Jessa mentioned, you partner with Article 22. You're the leader of Legacies of War. Tell us what it is, what its mission is, and how and why you started it. Yeah, well, Legacies of War, um, you know, it's it, it's an organization that you know, our mission is to really, really make sure that everyone knows the history of the secret war and the, the entire Vietnam War era conflict, as well as to advocate for funding to resolve these legacies of war, no pun intended, right, um, UXO. But before we talk about that, you know, I just want to give a brief history for those who may not be familiar with the Vietnam War era conflict. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so from 1964 to 1973, the United States dropped over 2.1 million tons of bombs on Laos in a span of 580,000 bombing missions. So this equals to about a plane load of bombs every eight minutes, 24 hours a day for nine straight years. Wow. All happen, yeah, without the knowledge of the American people. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, Congress didn't really find out about this until 1970, right? Like New York Times covered it. Um, but I have to really give credit to an American who happened to just be in Laos, um, Fred Brantman, right? You know, um, he is the person who really, really discover what was happening there during this time. Um, you know, as a young man, he was in Laos uh, working with um, the volunteer, international volunteer, I'm going to butcher it, um, VIS, <laughs> volunteer international group, right? Um, as an educator uh, there in the country. And he was um, noticing that all these refugees were coming into Vientiane, the capital. And he started talking to them along with his colleague, uh, Wen Nguyen, who is a Lao Laotian. And they asked these refugees to draw what they were experiencing and tell their story through drawings and through writing in their native language, right? And Fred and his colleague Nguyen collected these original sets of drawings, brought it back to the United States, testified in Congress, and really told members of Congress what was happening who also at the time didn't know since it was a CIA secret operation there. Wow. Um, and you might be asking yourself, like, why did the U.S. drop all these bombs on Laos when we were not at war with Laos? Um, you know, Laos was a neutral country in this conflict between America and Vietnam, but it was really because Laos just happens to um, be right next to Vietnam, right? Um, just the only fault that Laos had was this Ge geographical location. So the U.S. was bombing the trail in order to stop supply routes of the Vietnamese from, from getting from north to south and south to north, vice versa. And during this whole entire time, of course, um, the Vietnamese also realized what was happening. So they started changing routes. If you look at the map of Laos, you'll notice where the bombings data are, right? It's scattered along that um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and it's it's spreading out right um but i would also note too that you have to think like this is 60s and 70s um they don't have the same technology as we do today um so the coordinates that were written down about where these bombs were being dropped could be a little off 
We don't know what the weather was like. We don't know um, what other factors could be playing in. You know, could they see this or um, perhaps they thought it was this location, but it wasn't. But all those bombs that were dropped, about 30% of them failed to detonate. So right now, you know, we still have bombs laying in Laos that are still impacting the lives of the people. And it has this like horrible domino effect on every single aspect of the people's lives there. Yes, yeah, so you've got these, these communities throughout Laos that mm -hmm. have unexploded ordnance in the millions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to be exact, like um, there's so many types of bombs, right? Like um, I can list off the names, the walleye, the daisy, um, bombs ranging from like 3,000 pounds to tiny ones like this, you know, that I'm holding in my hand. These are looks like uh, it's about the size of your hand, like it would fit in your palm, kind of looks like a kiddish ball from, from Harry Potter, not to make light of it, but it yeah. looks like a normal tennis ball. You're absolutely right. And, you know, um, as much as like, I hate the fact that it looks like a toy and that it looks like a tennis balls, um, these things are deadly, right? They can, they kill, they were designed to kill and they do just that. Um, you know, just last, uh, not last month, but February, February 4th, a horrendous event occurred uh, where five school children were just walking home, um, all under the age of 10. Um, playing along the way, and then they spotted this uh, in, in the little corner, um, and they picked it up, started throwing it around, and it shook it, and it exploded. And two children were immediately killed, and the other three are severely injured. Um, and they're going to have to live with the scars of this for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, and, and that, that is like the real problem today. Like, the war did not end for the people of Laos. They're still continuously trying to figure out a way to live under this, right? Um, and, you know, the reason why, like, I think this particular tragedy that happened with these five children, it's really, really important to highlight, is the fact that out of the 17 province in Laos, right, like, we thought that Vientiane, this province, was relatively safe. Its major city is the capital of Laos, and this is where it's highly populated. But um, it is not, right? You know, there, there's so many shifts. Like when there's flooding that happened, these things can easily move and be in a spot where we thought that we cleared already. So it makes it harder for D miners to do their work. You know, they have to constantly survey and constantly figure out and make sure that this area that they deem safe is truly safe. Um, and also, you know, for me, um, that was actually an area where my family and I used to live. So I went to school just about three blocks away from Kasi district where the incident happened. Wow, that is really, really close. And what's resonating with me is this war happened 50 years ago. Children are dying literally almost yesterday. And this is where a place where you're from. And, and the US was involved and responsible for that. And I would say like Justin and I have been talking about this with you offline that we weren't really taught any of this history mm -hmm. that you're teaching us. Thank you for taking the time to explain what was really going on and why. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um I I'm I'm very happy to um to help share it because this is, you know, if like I went to school in the US as well and uh, we were taught like the Vietnam War, right? But we're not taught like the proxy war that happened in Laos or in Cambodia. You know, we're not taught that Americans was actually there, even though at the time we claim we were not, right? Um, at best, it ends up being like a footnote um, that yeah, and Laos was also involved and so was Cambodia. But, you know, um, Americans don't know this. And it's I think it's our responsibility to really make sure that we do teach, right? Um, I, I write a little bit about this in my blog where um, once you know about this history, you almost have this responsibility as an American to spread the word, right? I mean, it's, um, it, it's such an important part of our history as Americans, but our history as humanity, right? Like we can learn so much from this, like meaning um, one of the, the, the most haunting quote that, you know, Fred Bramfman has said um, in numerous interviews and, and in his book too, is that 
um, how could this have happened in this this country and to this people who um, could easily, like if we continue to bombing, we could have wiped off the whole entire country of Laos and people. And in a way, we did do that to some of the different ethnic groups, right? Like Laos, despite being so small um, and, and such a uh, small population of people, about 7 million, during this time of war, the population of Laos was around like 2.2 million people. Over 170 different ethnic tribal groups, different languages, different variations of cultures, and the people who were bombed the most, right? It's in that northern parts and also in the southern region. Um, and there's different diversity there that we probably don't know exists because we wiped it off. Not only did we wipe various ethnic groups off, like the face of this earth, we also wiped off historical sites, right? Like sites that have meaning to the people of Laos, like the Plain of Jars, various temples, various documents, like most of Laotian history that I know as a Lao American, as someone who's like born and raised there, um, came from my parents and my grandparents telling me. There are some documentations, but little is um, recovered from this time. And that's very, very sad, right? And while we can't change that, we can help tell this history to our children so that they know, you know, that they know that it's, it's wrong to bomb a country simply because we can uh, and simply because we were at war with like its neighbor but we have to really educate them that number one you know the least we can do now is learn from it and make sure it never happens again but number two try to restore some of this right um the more we know the more that we document the more we can share um and i think that's has this like healing effect um you know on 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 our society, like on the people that we meet and on our own um, uh, like personal journey, right? Like to me, like um, I think that's one of the most important thing that Legacies of War is able to do. Agreed. And thank you for showing up on this podcast so that we can spread awareness to our little network of businesses and people that are interested in the personal journey that we experienced was seeing this bracelet on article 22 just through social media and pulling up their website and reading more and learning about the secret war and kind of being like wait i am 35 years old and there is this war and now i feel responsible and my world has expanded i can't not know now <laughs> and so we looked into article 22 and she said you need to speak to sarah and understand the legacies of war um, story, you are adding so much social value to this problem and we really appreciate it. And I, I think it would really help us connect even further if you sort of explain how this war impacted your family, your personal journey. Yeah, um, very, it's, you know, it, it's a mission that's so near and dear to my heart and to my family's heart. Um, and, and I have to take you back even further. <laughs> um, you know, so my my parents um, were born in 1950, right? So when the first bomb was dropped in Laos, 1964, my father was only 14 years old. And um, I write about him a lot because he's he's had such an impact like on my understanding of the secret war, what happened to the people of Laos and how it's impacted my entire family like why I have cousins in France, why I have family in Canada, you know, why my cousins are all over like the US, um, you know, and and just so spread out, right? Like why most of us are not in Laos at this time. Um, like when the bomb dropped, uh, my dad was probably three blocks away from that first bomb that, that rained down on Laos. Um, at the time, you know, he was um, the eldest son. He was actually sent from the southern part of Laos to get an education in Vientiane, the capital. And he was living with monks um, and going to school, running errands to earn his keep. And that's just the way of life back then, right? Um, my dad actually wanted to be like governor of a province, you know, or an equivalent to like governor of a province. Um, but after seeing what was happening that span of nine years, seeing like his neighbors, his friends, their parents um, being 
maimed or killed really changed his perspective on what he wanted to do in life. So he became a doctor and he continued to seek like different ways to give back to this community and to what he witnessed as like a child, right? Like um, growing up uh, all through his teenage year, um, he wanted to make sure that the people who survived the war and who still had to continue living in danger had access to be able to get care and help as much as he can, him along with other groups of doctors during this time. Um, but, you know, even when the war ended, I remember growing up as a child, like just going to the most remote part of Laos um, and, and having my father be like that village doctor, right? Like, um, you know, to give folks who are listening some context, like many parts of Laos are so remote. There is no um, health ho hospital, you know, the healthcare infrastructure needs a lot of help. And, um, you know, I mentioned before, like, this domino effect, right? Like the country can't progress past this unless we resolve this bomb issue. Like Laos being the most bombed country on earth, like per capita, um, there's so much hurdles that they have to jump in order to build a better system to care for the people, right? Um, but going back to my father, uh, I remember too, you know, as a child, my parents actually um, dropped me off with my grandparents and I lived there while my mom and dad were in Cambodia um, as well. So not only did he care about just the people impacted um, in Laos, but him and a group of his doctor friends when they were growing up, they sort of made this pact that they would try to help like the region as much as they can and try to figure out a way to build a system, right? Like to make sure that survivors um, get the care that they need, children get prosthetics um, that they need in order to survive, right? Um, and all the way, you know, to, um, to when we finally figure out that this is like such a huge problem, right? Like it's not one person that can can resolve this, but my dad wanted to do his part. Um, but fast forward to 1990, like when uh, there's there's four of us, uh, me and my siblings, uh, Kay, Bay, myself, and Mickey. It was during this time that the third child, me, <laughs> started going to school that my dad was walking me to school and teaching me how to get myself to, to school because um, my siblings and I, uh, I don't know where Kay and Bay were going to school at the time, but um, I was going to a different school. So my dad like showed my younger brother and I how to walk safely to school, right? And we had to cross like the river and then we had to go through this, this um, like winding road in order to get to a small school building. And it's, it's almost like out of a movie or out of a book now that I think back because the floor of the school was dirt. The windows, there was no windows, you know, um, there was just a flagpole and there were like little desks. It's almost like think of schools in the 1800s, right? Where mm -hmm. bench and little, um, little small, small desks for children. I had one teacher that was all day, you know, for for the, the session. It wasn't like, you know, you go to history, math or so on, but um, I had such a fond memory of this. But, you know, throughout that whole walk, like my dad would say to Mickey and I, like, don't, um, don't, don't veer off on this road because tigers will come get you or, you know, the Naga, water serpents, or, or ghosts, or anything like to scare a, a small ch child. But, you know, what he didn't tell me was um, that it wasn't really those things that he was scared of. He was really scared that I wouldn't be able to come home in one piece if I stepped on a bomb, or if I encounter a bomb and thought it was a toy. So, you know, that really stayed with me as um, th throughout, like my childhood, just, just learning that. But I think it was at that, that point where my mom and dad really talked about it and they said, we, we can't raise our children in this environment. Mm -hmm. We have to take them out. Um, but I'll also you know, share that my dad didn't want to leave Laos. He loved, loved, loved Laos so much. You know, um, Generations of our family lived there. But during the war, all his siblings fled. Um, my mom's side of the family also fled but my dad decided to stay. And he was one of the few family members that decided to stay. And it was really difficult for him to make that decision to uproot his whole entire family. 
you know, at this time, um, I was only six years old and we started a new life here. Um, and then years and years later, um, we never talked about it. My parents sort of just wanted us to move forward and try to build a life and try to, um, you know, assimilate. You know, he was very, um, like, he was a proud American and he wanted us to love this country and we do. Um, but we didn't actually like learn more about this until, gosh, I would say I was in high school when um, I had some ridiculous argument with my mom, right? Um, she wanted me to be like a good Laotian girl and know about our culture. And at the time I didn't appreciate it. Um, I didn't want to do dance. Like I'm not graceful, I'll show you. <laughs> um, but Laotian dance was something that was very important to my mom. And um, I wanted to play soccer. I wanted to do like all the, you know, typical like boy stuff. And I argued with my mom and I just said, I don't want to go to practice anymore. Um, I suck at this and I never want to do it. And so like I cried and locked myself in a room and my mom told my dad to go talk to me. And so he really explained to me like the importance um, of dance to my mom. And he shared that when she was growing up, she couldn't do this because she was hiding from just the war. Mm -hmm. And it would mean the world to her if I knew this, this part of our culture. And that changed like my whole perspective on, um, on, on just some of the things that like we take for granted, right? Like mm -hmm. my parents couldn't do all these things that like I and my siblings are able to do um, because they were living through a war. Um, and so like later on, <laughs> life happened, graduated from school until finally um, my brother moved to DC and he called me and told me about legacies of war, you know, mm -hmm. and that's sort of how um, I got involved, became a volunteer um, and then joined a board and like about two years ago became the executive director. And I, um, I just feel like it's, it's come full circle, right? Like um, mm -hmm. it's now like my time and my opportunity to really be able to give back and carry forth the torch that our founder, Jenna Pakamonsa started um, 17 years ago. That's amazing. It's a, it's a brilliant like full circle story. We all come from different backgrounds and to yeah. think about, you know, me walking to school while you were walking to school and how different that was me an American in Oklahoma walking to school versus Sarah in Laos walking to school and the, the dangers and the troubles that I could come into versus the dangers and troubles that you could come into and how growing up and going through the educational system and not being taught that, mm -hmm. of course, that's my responsibility. Like ignorance is, is my problem. When did, um, can you explain to us a little bit about when the U.S. finally recognized that this was a thing that we were responsible for and how was legacies of war involved in bringing that awareness to the u.s government yeah yeah you know i'll um i'll start off by just saying that um there, there's really three pillars of legacies work right but to just take a step back and and actually answer your question right um i would say truly recognized was in 2016 when president obama became the first sitting u.s president to visit laos and acknowledge what happened right um and acknowledge like america's role in it and also do something about it by announcing 90 million dollars to be given to Laos in order to clear the bombs as well as assist survivors. Um, and by 90 million, I mean split up between three years, so 30 million per year, right? I would say that's really the first time that we as an American really acknowledge this and acknowledge, to quote President Obama, our moral obligation to Laos. But um, I'll also say that, you know, this, like the effort to try to clear uh, Laos started in the 90s. Right, like where we were as a country giving about uh, $3 million per year in the late 90s to start to do clearance work, um, to start this demining effort and assist survivors. But I still feel like there's such a long, long way to go, right? Um, you know, to put it into perspective, like if we were to convert how much we spent uh, in US dollars bombing Laos per day, um, it comes out to about $17 million a day 
bombing Laos, times that by nine years, right? To all the way to today, where we're giving $40 million to clear Laos, as well as assist survivors. It's, it's simply not enough, right? Um, like one third uh, of Laos is littered in bombs. So tiny little country, imagine like one third of the US being covered in bombs, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we, would, we would resolve that in a heartbeat, um, but this is Laos and not a lot of people know about it. Um, so I think this is where legacies comes in. You know, um, I really see our work in three pillars. One is the education and advocacy efforts that we're like so proud of, and this is the core of what we we do. You know, we started with this when we took the original drawings of the people from Laos. You know, the the refugees drew, and started like traveling with this in our early days in 2004 when we were first like starting. Right, Jenapa and our team really started this whole new era of just educating not just the American public, but people like myself who are, you know, 1.5 generation, um, being born in Laos, but raised here as a child, didn't know like the, the full breadth of what happened and didn't know the problem that exists today. Um, advocacy is, is like the most important thing that we do because this is what allows D miners to be able to have funds to clear Laos, right? And it's a very, very tedious task. There's a lot of work to be done. It's not like you just go out and dig and pull it out. It's They're risking their lives every day to do that. But we ensure that we talk to members of Congress and ask that we continue to sustain funding, right? We want to at least stay at 40 million, but you know, of course we want more. That's the minimum. Um, the ceiling would be just to commit to fund this until we get the, the job done, right? Um, so our advocacy effort has has led to, from 2004, it was like around 3 million, all the way to now, the highest funding in history, $40 million a year. Um, and, and that is, is something that we're proud of, but we also know that is, is simply not enough. The second part, you know, of our work is really to be this convener, being the voice of the diaspora community, as well as being the voice to connect the diaspora community who may have fled the war or who are children of the people who fled the war to the broader American public, because this is a history that we share together. Um, we do various talks, you know, right now we're only doing it on Zoom, <laughs> kind of like what we're doing now, right? Um, but we host educational talks through our Thipcal Talk series. Um, we also just launched our Legacies Library, which I'm most, most proud of. Um, you know, this is where we're encouraging like the community to help rewrite this. Um, you know, this is not, I, I don't want Laos to be remembered as, you know, this poor country that was bombed, but I want us to be remembered for like the strength of the people there, right? Like the people are starting to take action. There's so many young Lao Americans and especially women who are becoming D minors who are taking this, um, taking action to their own hands and really helping to resolve this so that the next generation won't have to worry about this. Um, there's so many advocates, you know, that are volunteers and champions and supporters of Legacy's work that help us um, talk to their representative, talk to their senators in various key congressional districts. You know, they're the voice. They're the people who are pushing their members of Congress to really support this by joining the UXO caucus or by joining on to letters asking for certain level of funding um, who are coming to share their story of how they survived the war or how they fled or how it's impacted their own family. You know, and I would say like the third and final piece of our work is building this new generation of young advocates. You know, um, none of us know how long we're going to be able to be fortunate to be, to be able to do this work. Um, but we know that we have to build that next cycle of people who are going to be future advocates. If we don't get the job done within our lifetime, we know that these young leaders will be able to do so. Um, you know, I'm very proud of our internship program where um, during a time like COVID, um, many people 
actually um, didn't accept interns, but we've actually expanded our internship program to allow for people to be interning with us remotely and from all over. We're actually talking to um, a couple of students who are in Laos, you know, to 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 help like educate even like the um, the, the young generation there who may not know the history and who may not know what a bomb is. Um, so, you know, these are some of the things that I feel like um, it, it's so important. Like our work is is very, very broad. Um, and there are so many key pieces that that have to be done in order to get to our ultimate goal of making sure that Laos is clear um, within our lifetime. And so with the work you're doing, how much land, how much has been cleared and how much is left to go? Like when you're saying it might not be done in our lifetime, it's it's hard to conceptualize that. Yeah, um, you know, um, it, it it is so hard because like I'm an eternal optimist. So I, I feel like it is possible. It is possible, it is doable within our lifetime. But where we stand right now, of the 30% of the bombs that didn't detonate, less than 1% is cleared today. So wow. we have a long, long way to go. If you just do, let's say, if, if we want to make it, if we want to simplify it, right? Like right now, at the rate of clearance with all the demining groups that are on the ground, it will probably take like 100 years. But that is not acceptable to us, you know, here at Legacies. Um, I don't want this to be the burden of like your children or my children. This is something that we can do today. Like we know how to do it. We just have to do it. And we just have to make sure the money is there for demining teams to clear, right? Um, or perhaps, you know, like figure out a way to invest in new technologies, um, figure out if there are new ways of clearance, right? Um, this is something that um, we're trying to do as well through like our innovation task force. Um, you know, we're starting this to pull together very intelligent people, people who are geophysicists, um, partnering with, you know, um, demining groups to see if there may be new technology that we can explore, right, to do. 1% um, sounds less than 1% does not sound like um, it, it's it's a David and Goliath type of situation, right? It's yeah. like, can we actually get this done? I think we can, it's just a matter of how. And um, not one person will have the right answer, but our role is to make sure the funding is there and to make sure that Americans know about this history and continue to care and continue to get more people in, involved, right? Like. Um, people can contribute in various different ways. Like, you know, if um, if there's someone out there <laughs> in in their garage who's working on some new technology, that's gonna be the next big thing. Maybe this will spark something in them. And perhaps this is this is like um, our way of moving this, uh, moving this along faster, right? Is the technology that, that or the innovation, is it around, mapping and discovery of where these things are or is it more how to appropriately remove or detonate what yeah what kind of branch of technology i don't even know the right word would be <laughs> would be helpful in developing well you and me both there um so you know just full disclosure i'm, I'm not an expert on this but this sort of came about because um you know uh, two of my board members are very tech savvy and um, Chris and Kevin, you know, if you guys are listening, they're they're the one who actually say, Sarah, we need to start looking into this because, um, you know, right now the the best technology is being used in Laos, right? Like I give so much credit to our demining partners who who have been doing such tremendous work. But where this came about was just through like one of those conversations where they're like what if there was an actual drone that can do this so that we don't have to have humans actually digging this up, right? Yeah. Um, what if there was a sensor that we can just start mapping and making sure that it's there? Um, you know, you might have seen this on TV with um, with the History Channel, right? Like looking at different uh, historical sites or places that we didn't even know exist, right? I think there is something out there. I don't know enough to be dangerous, but I do, I am interested in exploring all different ways of doing it, right? Especially if it means that 
we can make it safer for the men and women who are risking their lives every day in the field. Um, you know, there's even uh, one of our partners, um, Norwegian People's Aid, is looking into using dogs to detect this. Because, you know, you think about it, like dogs are lighter than human, some of them. <laughs> but, you know, um, they're able to sniff it out and, and, and the rate of success is it's admirable, right? And that could be something that we try in Laos. Um, you know, I know in Africa they use rats, um, but there's all sorts of things that we can do. Um, so many different ways to survey and to do it as safe as possible, you know, because we don't want the people risking their lives to be at risk. And we also wanna make sure that we do it fast and, um, and we do it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking like in San Diego, you know, there's uh, the defense contracting industry and, and a lot of technology when it comes to drones. And I know what Laurel's, I think, thinking about with as far as like some mapping technology. So I think just, you know, putting it out there that the ask like how, how we can help and maybe, you know, I'm not going to invent uh, a drone <laughs> that can solve this, but we might be able to talk to people who know about drones and start to connect the dots and and same financially, you know, like we might not be able to move the needle, but finding out like how we can advocate for legacies of war. And like you said, bring awareness mm -hmm. to the challenges and the, the impacts that it has today. I just think is really, really important for us all to think about. And now that we know about it, what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, and, and kind of on that, you know, as I'm thinking about this and bringing awareness and, and something that is, I think is more, I guess, mainstream media is, you know, the anti-Asian sentiment mm -hmm. and listening to you and hearing about your family's story about being involved in a war that the U.S. led and bombed your country that caused people to flee and emigrate to the United States. And now there's this sentiment. And I, I think, you know, people don't, I don't want to say people, but it seems like there's this perception people don't understand, or it's like, this is my country. What are you doing here? Kind of mm -hmm. thing. And, and it's, I hate even saying that out loud, but just the, the stories in the news the last few weeks are, are awful. And I don't know if that's, uh, how do I say this? I'm sure this is something that's been happening a lot more than I would like to admit to myself, but I'm glad it's getting attention. I'm sad it's happening. And so you know, I guess I'm just wondering your perspective on that as an, you know, an Asian American and your work, you know, with Laos in the U.S. and, and just kind of your perspective on all this. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, thank you, first of all, like for even bringing that up. It's very important. It's very, very near and dear to the Asian American community um, and, and especially in a time like this. Right. Um, and you're right. Like this is nothing new. It started way, way back, you know, when the, when the Chinese first came to the U.S., right? Um, and th there's so much that we as Americans don't know, you know, and I myself included in that. Um, you know, for me, I think this is one of the most important things that legacies can do is share this history so that people know that not everyone who who comes to, like, the United States is, is seeking that American dream, right? Like, many people were just simply fleeing for their lives or they just fled for the safety of their children like my parents did. And I think it's so important to also understand that Asia as a continent is the largest continent in the world. Um, each country has its own language, you know, unique language, unique culture, and to clump it in as one um, uh, or as a region, you know, in this case, a lot of people tend to clump Southeast Asia is I, I think there's a flaw to that. You know, you have to understand how even like this secret war, um, the Vietnam War era conflict within the region, every single one of the countries impacted like Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam experienced it differently. Um, and, and the type of narrative that came out of that through mainstream media during the 60s, 70s, and even like early 80s, I would say, um, sort of gave this picture and, and portray like Asian American woman in, in a certain light, right? And most of the time is negative. It's prostitution or damsel in distress, right? But that is not the case. And I think for our work at Legacies of War, the reason why we created Legacies Library is because we want 
to that some of the things that are written, make sure it's factual and make sure that we show the whole entire picture. And we encourage the people who are affected to actually take back the power, right? Like write your own narrative, write your own story. If this is not accurate, tell a story that you experienced. You know, it's it's really, really um, been inspiring for me to see this new initiative shape because it's making me also want to expand like my blog, you know, to include more of um, how the war not only affects the people in Laos right now, but it's still affecting Lao Americans here, but also the broader diaspora community that's lives were, were um, like disrupted by the broader Vietnam War era conflict, right? Like when we got to the US, it wasn't like all magic and, you know, flowers and unicorns, like our lives wasn't just perfect miraculously, right? My dad was a doctor. He couldn't become a doctor again here. My mom was a seamstress. You know, and she couldn't become a seamstress here. They had to get three, two different jobs in order to keep us. Like my siblings and I had to learn a whole new language. Like I didn't even know what high was, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we had to figure out how to interact with all these different um, groups of people, you know, and 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 understand how to um, like build a new life. It was very, very hard, and it remains hard for so many people who still have to move around, you know, whether that be move within the country of Laos. You know, if you can't grow your crop here because you notice that your neighbor two doors down just had an accident, you're trying to move to a different area, but there's the same problem. Some people choose to leave, like, the country of Laos and come start a whole new life here or elsewhere, but it's... it it's going to take a lot more. And I think, you know, what will really, really be helpful is that more people um, feel inspired to share their story, um, you know, and for people out there who have friends who are of Asian heritage, ask them, you know, how did their family, like, what is their family story? You know, um, mm -hmm. many of them were born here. So I was gonna say like, tell me about, you know, how your family ended up here. Um, for me, you know, that would be true, but for others um, who may look like me, but they're born and raised here and they've never set foot in Laos, right? Or they never set foot in Cambodia or Vietnam or, or elsewhere. But just being more open to learning and being more open to question some of the different history books that we're taught um, and to also to do your own research, right? Like I'm still learning to this day and I've been involved with legacies for you know, almost seven years, but I'm still uncovering things that's making me think and making me feel um, like there needs to be more done. And I don't know if that means like every single school in the United States have some sort of curriculum, but I do think that there is an interest and especially at the college level right now, you know, like I love getting getting, getting invitation to be a guest lecturer, um, you know, at, at various universities because even at that level, like, people are so unaware of it, right? And it's not their fault that you don't know. Like I didn't know, but now that we do know, we have to be able to expand this. Like it could literally be a course or a department of its own at any of these various universities. How big is the the diaspora community in the United States, Laotian? Yeah, um, it's, it's an estimate, you know. Um, I know that there was just a census that was done, but I, like would estimate to be around like 350,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thinking about one of your pillars is funding. One of your pillars is advocacy. One of your pillars is diaspora. I'm thinking that the government, federal and state and local, only has so much capacity in terms of funding and finance and competing budget items, competing policies. It seems like an opportunity for business that can scale, that can have an impact, that's not beholden to red tape, that is private funds, has a role to step in. And we learned about a public-private partnership with Article 22, mm -hmm. and I'm excited to hear about you know the release that's coming up. And I think one call to action for our listeners is now you now you know now you've heard the story. There's some practical ways asking people about their story, being sensitive to the Asian American diversity. 
And also, if you own your own business or you work in a business, go to your leadership and say, how can my business contribute top line revenue to legacies of war to support advocacy and to provide a sustainable funding mechanism? It's a common practice in the business for good movement where we don't wait for profit to donate so that we reduce our tax liabilities necessarily. So it's not a philanthropic thing. It's if you contribute your top line revenue, then it's a sustainable funding source. You're tied to it and you show and demonstrate that when I do well, this group does well. And I'm not going to wait for profit. It's built into my business model, even if it's and just a reminder to our listeners, there's a 1% for the planet program that is well used and it's it's a great thing. Think about contributing 1% to legacies of war and being a part of the solution financially, not just through verbal social value, also through financial value. And you know, with that said, I kind of want to understand. We know that the bottom is $40 million a year for the government to contribute. What other policies, legislation, or, or funding mechanisms do you have in the works that you want to advocate for? And or how much money do you need from the private industry on an annual basis to move that 100-year mark way to our lifetime? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um really, really important thing that you just list out. And and I love the idea of getting more and more of our corporate friends to be more involved, like Article 22, right? Um, Who we, of course, as you know, have like the trailblazer line with. Um, But there's so many different ways to contribute. Um, You know, I'll just highlight uh, one thing since it just happened. Um, One of our partners, Sage, um, Sage, Sage helped us by contributing like laptops, right? Like we're we're such a small team. And since we were expanding our internship program, you know, I reached out to Sage Sustainable Electronics and asked Joe Vasquez, who is their CEO, um, to help because, you know, it, it sounds silly and frivolous, but um, a laptop is, you know, we could get one for maybe $500, $600. But to get a good one um, that's in the thousand would cost so much for an organizations like Legacies of War. So we were able to get that donated through our partnership with Sage. And yes, you know, it is an item, but it's not like a um, direct cash donation, right? But every every little thing help us. Um, I just want to also reiterate too that the 40 million that's coming from our government is being donated straight into country, not to the government of Laos, but to organizations that work on the ground, like Mine Advisory Groups, um, Norwegian People's Aid, Halo Trust, UXO Lao, which is the in-country group that's doing the demining work. Also goes to programs um, uh, through world education, right? Like where it's going through the Leahy War Victims Fund to help with survivors and victims of mining tragedies. Um, Legacies of War does not get a penny from that. And we are so like proud that this is going straight to the people doing the work on the ground. We're funded through our partnership with, you know, folks like Article 22 and various like partners all throughout the United States and Europe and all over who are contributing like $20 here, you know, $20 there, $30,000 here very, very small group of people. You know, I would say our donor base is around two to 3,000 in any given year and all under, like the average give is under a hundred dollars. Um, and we can't do it without all of our partners. Um, we only have three staff. Um, you know, we really depend on the power of our volunteers and on the power of our board of directors who are volunteering their time to help us fundraise, to help us doing speaking engagements, right? Um, with only three of us, as you can imagine, like we can't do it all, (laughs) but we're so lucky to have these various partners be a part of it. Um, You know, one of the things that my team and I are trying to work on is how do we do more um, with the limited staff that we have? We write so many grant requests um, and many times, you know, it's very competitive. There's so many organizations doing so many incredible things um, that we're competing for every single cent that comes through our door. Um, We operate on a very, very tiny budget of under 350,000 a year. Yeah, and we don't don't even have an office right now. So (laughs) just to to let you know how small we are. But, you know, I would really, really invite 
those who just want to do something good, you know, want to help us tell the truth, want to help us spread the message, want to help make an impact in a people's lives that are in danger to this day, um, to get involved, you know, with us. Um, every little dollar goes a long way. Like we're able to really amplify that through our outreach to members of Congress and, and make sure that there is funds available for the people doing the work on the ground. And tell us about, um, you know, for those of us, us jewelry enthusiasts, the line that's coming through 22 is another way that we can also support you. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm so excited about this. Um, but first, you know, I have to let people know about our original bangle that's with Article 22. It has trailblazer written in it in English and in Lao. Um, and the the meaning of Lao is, is multifaceted, right? Um, it's Sintam Sawang, which literally means like trailblazer. Um, it's one who creates a safer and brighter path forward for others. So think of someone who has helped like be that door opener for you, right? People who motivates you, people who simply just want to help others. It also literally means like clearing a path, you know, just like what our demining teams are doing on the ground. And 30% of the sale of this comes straight to help fuel our mission here at Legacies. And I am so pumped and jazzed to um, share that we just launched a new version of the Trailblazer. It's a more adjustable version. It's gold metallic thread. And this is very, very special being that it's launched during this time, right in time for Lao New Year. So, hey, which I'm so excited to celebrate mm -hmm. for three days. Yeah, tell us about Lao New Year. Happy, how do I say Happy New Year in Laotian? Lao, so D, be my. So D is, is basically like good luck um, and be my is new year, right? So um, Lao New Year is celebrated in April and this year it just falls on April 13th, uh, 14th and 15th. So we celebrate three days. Thank you mother for just making sure I knew those dates. Um, yeah, thanks mom. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the year this year is also um, very unique because Lao New Year is celebrated on the Buddhist calendar, uh, which is the year 2,564. So right on April 15th, that marks that new year. And the way Laotians all over the United States and abroad um, um, would be celebrating when it wasn't a pandemic, would be tons of people at the temple, tons of people on the streets, throwing water at one another to um, cleanse away the, the all the bad things that happened in the previous year and welcome in the new year in like a new cleanse, pure light. Um, and the reason why we chose to launch our new um, metallic adjustable bracelet with Article 22 is because one of the customs is to tie a string around a person, you know, your friend, your mom, your dad, someone that you love to wish them good luck, you know, good health, whatever you want to wish them during that this new year and let them tie that on to really like help capture that good blessing, um, good luck, good fortune. And they wear it for three days and then they're allowed to take it off then. But this we want, you know, everyone to um, know about the beautiful like culture, like of the people of Laos, but also to show how we can also take part in this, you know, custom or ritual um, and, and help each other move forward in, a better um year right uh, whatever year it is for you so, <laughs> and we could all use good luck right now right mm -hmm. exactly well, um i think we're about at our time unless you have yeah we i think yeah but i um want to make sure we get to everything so i think another thing um that we had talked about was a bill legislation we're working you're working on so yeah. there's a lot of ground to cover. Like we said, we could talk all day. So uh, no. I think it is the important, uh, the important highlights. Yeah, I can go really, really quick. And I have to definitely give a shout out to Senator Baldwin and her team, um, Blake Suter, who we've been partnering with on this. Um, you know, this is historic if we can get this bill to, to pass. It's called the Legacies of War and UXO Removal Act. Um, this bill does two very important things. The first, it would recognize all the people who fought alongside American troops, like our own veterans, would get that same recognition as American veterans. The second thing, and really, this is like legacy's bread and butter, 
is it would allocate funds for clearance effort, not only in just Laos, but Cambodia and Vietnam as well. So $100 million for the next five years would go towards demining efforts as well as survivor assistance in the countries that were impacted by the Vietnam War era conflict. So, you know, right now, Senator Baldwin is sponsoring the bill and we're really, really looking for like a strong leader on the Republican side to help co-sponsor it. And, you know, if, if they're listening, I, I hope um, that Senator Marco Rubio would consider this or Senator Mitt Romney would really help um, step up and really help lead this effort along with Senator Baldwin to get this passed. Thank you. We will tag mm -hmm. them in our social media posts. Yes, please. Uh, put it out there. So you, you had shared with us a, a lot of ways during this conversation and in writing too about how people can get involved and help. And uh, we posted that in the comments for this. So if there's anything that you would like to highlight, I'm sure, you know, contacting your um, congressperson or representative to help with some of these initiatives is, is one of the top things that we can do as individuals that doesn't cost anything but a few minutes of your time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that's always, always a good thing to do is, you know, I, I just want people to know that they have the power, they're a constituents, they have a voice, you know, we elect these people to represent us for a reason, right? Like we want them to act in the interests of the American people and to things that matter to you. So that's always, always something to do. But for this particular bill, you know, um, we're really, really looking for more organizations to endorse the bill, right? Mm -hmm. Like any organizations out there, perhaps like um, strong organizations in Florida or in Utah, please, you know, reach out to us. Um, you can contact us through our all our social media, it's Legacies of War, um, and, and, and let us know that you'll be willing to put your stamp of approval on this and help us push this through because it's it's the power of all of us coming together and, and bringing that voice uh collective voice all over that's going to help make sure that this bill is passed great thank you sorry i thought i was on mute for a second because oh. i've been muting we have a train or a trolley track so i mute sometimes and it was like oops um yeah i think we are we're doing great on time. So I think we're ready to wrap up uh, with our three key takeaways, our three-point landing. Yeah, I, I love this. I love that you do the three-point landing. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, what, what I want our listeners today to really, really know that this is an American issue and this is something that we should care about and that we need to really take actions on. Like bombs are killing today. Like for the people who are living in Laos, the war is not over. Like we dropped them, so let's clean them up. Um, this problem has been ignored way, way too long. Like we know how to do it. And we as Americans need to really take action and hold ourselves accountable and responsible for making sure that we get the job done. Um, secondly, you know, Legacies of War is an organization with only three full-time staff. And we just hired the third one like this month. So <laughs> finally, like I'm, I'm so proud of us for being able to do that. But in order for us to be effective and build more awareness um, and make sure that we reach more of a broader audience and get more people to be involved, um, we need your help, right? And help can come in numerous ways, as Jessa and Laurel has said, you know, corporate leaders, consider making a gift to us. Um, consider as well, you know, um, an opportunity for us to speak to your like employee base. Um, you know, May is coming up. And it is like a AAPI Awareness Month, um, Asian American History Month. Um, this is a great opportunity to invite people to learn more about like this, um, like Laotian community is like a minority within a minority, right? And this is a history that not a lot of people know about. So consider this as a way to help educate. You know, I love being invited to speak, um, you know, various universities were so happy to come and share the knowledge that we've been able to really accumulate over the years, all the research that have been done, um, all the various books, you know, um, and, and people who help make it possible so that we can like tell the story in a truthful and honest way. Um, so invite us out, you know, engage with us, follow our work on social media. Last thing that I would say is this is a problem that we know how to solve and within our lifetime, right? Like, I don't want this to be the burden of the next generation. 
this is a problem that all we really need to is to continue to have more advocates, you know, on the Hill, making sure that our government continue to help fund this. But two, um, this is a problem that all of us can take part in. You know, it's um, it's a story of humanity and how we help each other. We're the ones that there's so many of us and all we have to do is just reach out and do something. Um, so if you're looking for ways um, to get involved, you know, please knock on our doors, reach out to us, and we'll be more than happy to to get you involved in like the way that makes sense for you, right? Like whatever way that is. So thank you so much for tuning in today as well and, and listening. And thank you, Jess and Laura, for having me. Yes, thank you for sharing. We're so happy to know you, to be connected to you and to help give a platform and a voice to Legacies of War. Find them at LegaciesWar.com. All right, send it, Jessa.